So good morning everyone. Uh, is this working? Can you hear me? Thank you. Well, uh, this lady is kindly bringing up my presentation. I'd just like to say this is my first visit to Egypt and I've been here less than 12 hours. That's better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, while my presentation is coming up, uh, I was just saying that this is my first visit to Egypt and I've been here less than 12 hours. And in that time, I've crossed the Aswan Dam, I've sailed over the Nile, and I've found out a huge amount about the Egyptian health service. So this is obviously, uh, I'm packing a lot into to these two days, and it's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. So I was asked to talk about the critical role of the general practitioner. And I wanted to cover generalism. What, what are we talking about in terms of what is a general practitioner? Um, what is medical generalism? Why does it matter? And then to talk about general practitioners and their role in the United Kingdom. And in my presentations, I often talk about <coughs> GPs as the expert medical generalists. And there's something to me really important um, about the establishment and the value of primary care in recognising the skills and expertise of the medical practitioners in this setting. And so this is a definition that, that we use, uh, medical generalism, a professional philosophy of healthcare practice described as expertise in whole person medicine. So we're talking here about an approach to care which is centred around people. It's centred around the person. We'll often say uh, in the UK that in hospitals, people come and go and the diseases are the same. And in general practice, diseases come and go and the people are the same. So it's quite a different perspective, and I do believe it's crucial to understand that. And we are looking, we are looking after people over time. Uh, the way in which we structure our system in the UK is that a general practice, a unit of care, has a registered list. So a group of doctors and the people, the nurses and others who work with those doctors, will look after this group of people over time. We take a continuous long-term view and we deal with every condition that comes along pretty much from cradle to the grave. And in looking after populations, in looking after individuals over time, you have to understand about them, the individual. You're not just an expert in medicine, you're an expert in that person together with them. You understand that person, you understand their family, you understand the circumstances in which they live, and you relate what's happening in terms of health, illness, disease, in the context of that individual. I'll just skip over that one. So why does it matter? You know, why do we think that medical generalism is of huge value in a well-balanced healthcare system. And I'd just like to say here, I, you know, I think we need both in any well-functioning healthcare system. We need specialists and we need acute care and we need those to be accessible, reliable, high quality. Likewise, any good healthcare system needs and should value generalists and the skills and expertise that they bring. Generalists are committed to the individual. You have the long-standing relationship over time with an individual. You understand their health issues and you understand the disease processes that, that are going on. We don't you know, pass people on, we, we, we're always there for that group and for those individuals. Obviously, we refer on when we need the skills and expertise of specialists, 
but ultimately the patients come back to us. And so we have that ongoing relationship with that individual over time. And we deal with many issues um, of prevention, diagnosis, other problems, again, in, in the context uh, of, of the individual's life. And by and large, we manage these problems within our own expertise. It's relatively rare for me to refer patients. I will refer about 5% of the patients that I see. That's about average uh, in the UK. So we will manage most of the problems that we see whilst recognising um, what we can and what we should be dealing with. And we are also able to manage multiple ongoing conditions in one individual. And certainly for the UK uh, and for many other uh, countries, societies, that's becoming increasingly important. Now I always apologise for this slide, don't even think about trying to read it, I just want you to look at the colours, okay? Light colours and dark colours, and, and I'll explain. Um, we're starting, um, certainly in the UK, definitely within my college, in other areas of the world, to recognise that the management of multiple conditions is not about taking each disease or each condition in isolation, managing that one up in terms of the appropriate guidelines and protocols that would be for that, and then taking the next one and doing the same. That is not good medicine, it's not good for patients, it leads to polypharmacy, it leads to duplication, it leads to consumption of huge amounts of time and resource. And actually, multimorbidity is increasingly a problem for 21st century healthcare. I do say it's of particular concern to us in the UK because unlike Egypt, as I've just discovered, uh, our population is skewed more towards the elderly. And as people get older and have had good health care, it's a success story that nowadays in the UK, people no longer have their heart attack and die. They survive with their heart disease. They no longer get cancer and die. Cancer increasingly is a long-term condition. And what this means for us is that people now live with multiple conditions. And the point about this slide and the colours um, this was from a study done in Scotland, my part of the world, actually. Uh, it related to over a million patients, and the point was to look at um, the number of conditions that would, that would be present when you've got other index conditions. So you don't need to try and read it, but the one at the top is heart failure. And what they, what they were looking for was, in this population of people who had heart failure, what proportion just had heart failure, what proportion had heart failure in one other condition, what heart failure in two others, heart failure in three others. So the top bar on here, in this population, 3% of people who had heart failure only had heart failure. And the dark blue line, that's heart failure and three other ongoing conditions. That was 74%. So if you look in this population at the light colours, um, I'll tell you the figures for uh, diabetes. It's 14% of patients with diabetes only have diabetes. And it's 47% that have three or more ongoing conditions. Uh, likewise with cancer, likewise with dementia, anxiety, there's epilepsy, there's asthma, COPD in there. But the point is that certainly in our population, increasingly we're dealing with people who have multiple ongoing problems. And that's a challenge for the health service. And it's very much a challenge for we GPs as expert medical generalists who are dealing with these people with all the problems and over time. Now the factor here that I think might well uh, be of relevance, particular relevance um, in Egypt, is that we do know, um, although classically we think of multimorbidity as something that affects 
older ageing populations, um, this study in the west of Scotland very clearly showed that the onset of multimorbidity was um, 10 or 20 years earlier in more deprived populations. And actually there are many more people in middle age with multimorbidity than there are old people because there are, you know, there are more people in their um, 40s and 50s than there are in their 70s and 80s. Uh, and that again I think is an issue where there are significant income inequalities significant areas of deprivation, I suspect there is likely to be a lot of multimorbidity. So I hope I haven't laboured this too much, but it's increasingly um, a point that we believe as GPs, as generalists, we need to deal with, and we need to be able to deal with that within healthcare systems. So again, going back to a generalist, what would you expect from your generalist position? Uh, and we would expect the, a good generalist to be trustworthy. We spoke earlier about public satisfaction, and if I could just say a little bit more about this. Actually, um, the British public value the NHS above any other public service or national institution. The NHS is more popular and revered than the royal family. The NHS is more popular than schools or education or any other service that our citizens expect. And actually, the most trusted profession in the United Kingdom is the GP. People trust and people value their GP more than anything else. The satisfaction rates with general practice are quite humbling, actually. And it comes, I'm sure it comes back to this basis of trust, and we've already had some discussion this morning about um, you know, with the primary care services there, why isn't it used? I, I really think that the issue of trust and confidence in the service and in the individual is, is absolutely critical, and it might well be worth thinking a bit more about. Um, so, you need to be trustworthy. You need to develop the therapeutic relationship. We, um, there's a school uh, in the UK uh, that studies the teachings of a Ballant, who was a, um, a doctor and a psychotherapist, and he coined the expression, the drug doctor. So the relationship between a patient and a trusted physician gives improvement in health conditions in and of itself. So when you have this ongoing trusted relationship with your, with your doctor, then that relationship is therapeutic. And the generalist does need to make judgments that are safe not only for the individual, but for the system as a whole. So I'm going to come on again to the, the gatekeeper function. Um, we we need to look after our patient and the patient in front of us and we need to put them first. But we also need to think about how the system works and our role in the system. So if, for instance, um, I as a GP decided that every patient I saw with a cough should have a chest x-ray, you know, I, I want to exclude uh, cancer or pneumonia or you know, set, you know, whatever I want to exclude, I'll send all my patients with cough for a chest x-ray, then the whole system in, in England would, would, just, would just fall over if we all did that. It just wouldn't work. And again, we talk about ourselves, GPs, as the risk sink for the NHS because we carry, we absorb huge levels of risk appropriately so, for our patients and for the system. So, talk a little bit about um, general practice in the UK, and I'm in complete agreement with Sir David. Um, this is what works for, uh, by and large, most of the time, within the constraints. This is what works for us in the UK. It's not necessarily the system that works everywhere, um, and uh, there's, you know, there's particular 
cultural settings and um, appreciations, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's useful just to describe uh, the system as we have it. So we consider, and we do, provide physical, psychological and indeed social care to patients. The ongoing discussions about the extent to which we do non-medical uh, roles in general practice for patients. Um, but ultimately, if these contribute to a person's well-being and their state of health, then you, know, you, you could concede that there is a role there for the GP. We are the first point of contact for the majority of NHS services. So around 90% of NHS contacts will be dealt with in general practice by the GP or a member of their team. And we do this for just around about 8% of the budget. So um, considerably less than um, you know, what was it? 11 billion would be about 10% of um, the current NHS budget. We've, we've considerably less than that for the service of general practice. And per individual, the cost of care, of general practice care, for one year for an individual is of an average of £136. And I don't know how that would equate uh, in, in your system, but in the UK it's very difficult to get health insurance for a pet for £136. So people spend more on their hamsters and their rabbits, health insurance, than the government pays GPs for a year of care. Uh, these are UK figures. Um, David was talking about England. So there are around 60,000 GPs in the UK and 10,000 practices. And almost the entire population is registered with the GP. They have their own doctor. Every day, and this is now, um, well, it's more of a, no, it's still a UK figure. 1.2 million consultations every working day in general practice. I'm sorry to just keep trotting out numbers at you, but we have a population of around 63 million. So 1.2 million in a day from 63 million, I haven't got the percentage in my head, but that's a heck of a lot, actually. And actually, David talked about slightly falling levels of satisfaction. And the biggest issue that patients and the public have with the service of general practice is that they can't get access to it yet we're giving 1.2 million appointments a day. So there is this just, um, you know, the difficulty in meeting the demand, the huge demand actually, that is for the service. The British, pub, the, sorry, the British public like and value British general practice. They want more of it. And that, that's a big problem for us. In our system, most children will reach adulthood without ever having seen a, a paediatrician. I have two daughters, admittedly I'm a GP, but my daughters never saw a paediatrician. That's not unusual. Um, we, do, we deal with children, we deal with mental health, we deal with gynae, we do the immunisations, we, we do a, a very comprehensive range of services and, and we are the, 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 first, uh, the first point of contact for almost everyone for almost everything to do with the NHS. I mentioned the, um, you know, the, the well, I, I think it's hugely cost effective, I actually think it's too cost effective. Um, I think actually our service would work better if we skewed the balance a bit more to general practice, if we had a bit more investment in general practice, actually it would make the whole service work more effectively. But the cost of care for a year that I mentioned to you, that cost of care is around about um, uh, one-tenth of a day's stay in hospital 
and it's actually less than the cost of one hospital outpatient appointment. So the service of general practice in the UK is hugely cost effective and efficient. GP services are free for the patient at the point of care. Um, for you know, people can have as many consultations as they can get in a year. The average is about six. Six consultations a year with the GP is average for the British public. Um, we do provide out of our services and uh, we also continue to provide home visits. We've heard the term gatekeepers already this morning, so um, we believe that part of our service to the public is the function of gatekeeping. So I talked about the advantages of having a specialist. When my patient really needs to see a surgeon, I want them to see a surgeon as soon as, as, as possible and as, as efficiently as possible. But I really, really, really don't want to send patients who don't need to see a surgeon to see a surgeon. You know, we need to keep those people away from surgeons. Because if you don't really need surgery, that's the last thing that you should be having. I'm sorry, I'm not being critical of surgeons here, I've just pulled that out. I can use the same example for, for anyone else. So there's something about getting the person to the care, the specialist care, uh, when they need it. And that's hugely appropriate and has to happen. But keep them out from specialists when they don't need it. Because if you get to see a specialist and you don't need a specialist, then it's generally, that's where you get a lot of harm from medical care that we really could do without. Um, and the idea of continuity of care I've already referred to um, is, is we're very proud of the continuity of care we, we deliver. We really wish it was better. You know, we feel that this is something that we should be improving on is our continuity of care for patients. And we do know that where there is good continuity of care, that um, all sorts of health outcomes including mortality rates actually, are considerably improved. It's very important to say that, you know, I'm, I'm here as the chair of the Royal College of GPs, that's my constituency, that's who I represent, but GPs are one uh, role in the system of general practice and primary care. And we work with, with nurses, with managers, counsellors, healthcare assistant, assistants, increasingly we're bringing people like pharmacists, physiotherapists, um, mental health workers into the context of general practice and working as an extended team. And so here I think are some of the key strengths of general practice, of our system of general practice in the United Kingdom. Personalised holistic care. I can't say often enough the idea that um, a patient has their doctor, uh, that they know and who knows them. And that really is fundamental to the way in which the whole system works. We do diagnosis, treatment, health promotion and prevention. We do palliative care. I didn't mention that, but actually our palliative care um, is regarded extremely highly internationally, quite possibly the best in the world. We have a gatekeeping role, we have a coordinating role so that we try to keep tabs on what's happening with our patient wherever else they're going in the healthcare system. We have the population list-based approach and we have satisfaction and trust. And these are a few documents, if those, those of you who are particularly interested in medical generalism um, and the values of generalism um, for medicine and within a healthcare system, and uh, you know, very happy to pass those on. And if there's time, sir, I'm very happy to take questions. Yes, sir.